test. Hello. Well, the famous set. Dr. Craig talk show <laughs> background up. So uh, I guess that makes me a guest comedian at the front end of a... Anyway, um, I'm Joe Mulvihill. I teach apologetics up the road at uh, uh, Mount Perrin School. Uh, I'm in a doctoral program in New Testament studies, uh, doing a comparison between New Testament and mythology. That'll be the topic I'm talking about this morning. Um, I want to go ahead and apologize for the inevitable disappointment of uh, Dr. Craig's absence here. Uh, he is serving the Lord well uh, over in the UK uh, with his wife Jan, uh, doing good work over there. And it's not a debate, like uh, you were told before, so that's a good thing. He's just going to be offering advice and admonition to other believers and emboldening them. Uh, yeah, I uh, was going to talk to you guys today about my uh, what I'm doing in my... PhD uh, dissertation research, uh, before everybody nods off to sleep, we can, uh, it, it does have some uh, practical, uh, astoundingly practical benefits. I've had a bit of a setback recently. Uh, my director said that at, after 417 pages of research, which if any of you have done a PhD, every couple sentences you have to pass off to someone else who said what you just said. That means footnoting. So um, he said it's unmanageably broad. Information I could have used a couple years ago, but uh, it, he said it would make a fantastic book. So, uh, you know, that's small consolation, but I've, I've gone back and revamped and done a much, much more modest thesis proposal. And hopefully uh, what I was doing before will serve as a, a reference for a layperson uh, and uh, pastor or clergy alike. So uh, good to be here with you guys. Uh, always, always incredibly uh, humbling to be asked by Dr. Craig to come here and, and uh, try to offer you guys something practical for your walk with uh, Christ and uh, how, to, how to live in an increasingly post-Christian culture. So uh, at least that's the way it appears. So uh, what I wanted to start with, first apologize for the handout. Could it be any more basic? I may as well just give you a blank sheet of paper. But I wanted to leave you room to write in the margins. There's some things you might want to write to go and explore on your own. There's other things that are more central that I think you'd need, but you, uh, uh, you won't need... Uh, you might need all the space, then again, you might not. It depends on what kind of note taker you are. So um, I hope to offer you some, uh, some really, really valuable information. But today we're going to look at one of the most esteemed categories skeptics put the Gospels in, and indeed the entire Bible in, is that's the, the, the genre of mythology. The genre of mythology. And I'm going to be summarizing two evangelical scholars' works so that you don't have to read their entire works unless you so choose, but you'll, you'll have a handle on what they're getting at. The primary uh, work we're going to be pulling from in this teaching is a book called The Bible Among Myths by a guy named John Oswalt. He's the uh, chair of Ancient Near Eastern Studies at Wheaton College, uh, a, a college that has uh, given Dr. Craig many awards and attempted to pull him over uh, onto their faculty many, many times. Very prestigious Christian school in Illinois. Uh, the second guy we're going to be pulling from is a guy named John Walton. John Walton. So John Oswalt and John Walton. His book's called Ancient Near Eastern Thought in the Old Testament, just to make sure I give you the exact, the exact title there. But that's, that's what we're going to be pulling from today. And we're going to be talking about why the Gospels in particular and the Bible in general don't deserve to be classed amongst myth mythography. Uh, now, most of us just sort of intuitively know, well, they shouldn't. We've been raised in a Christian tradition that, this doesn't really accord with mythology. Maybe we can harken back to a, a random quote by C.S. Lewis who spent his life reading mythology and legends and said, look, whatever the Gospels are in the New Testament, or even some parts of the Old Testament, it isn't mythology. It's just not. Um, some of us just think, well, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But you need to know there's an increasing assumption that it is today, especially outside of the walls of this church and our community. My brother is a firefighter in Woodstock, Georgia. He had a uh, gentleman, he got in a discussion with a gentleman in one of their, uh, their downtimes that was a new firefighter, uh, about a 24-year-old uh, gentleman that was new with their, their department there in Woodstock. I think it's okay to say. I won't give any names, but my brother was talking to him, and he said, he kept telling my brother, I'm very familiar with the Bible. I'm extremely familiar with the Bible. I know what you're talking about. I'm extremely. And then at one point in the conversation, he said, yeah, you know, the story's about Medusa and the Kraken. <laughs> no, oh, straight face. No, no lie at all, straight face, Medusa, Kraken, Perseus, Theseus, all of these things. And my brother just, you know, he starts laughing, not to insult the guy, but you, I mean, this is not, you don't, there's no Kraken in the Bible, there's no, there's no you know, Theseus, this sort of thing. Um, if anybody, 
uh, had the inevitable disappointment of seeing the Noah movie. Uh, uh, I, I, I got it loaned to me from a friend as a joke, uh, but there are people that assume that that's, that's, the, that's how the story went down in the Bible. Um, the director of that movie, uh, Aaron, I think Darren Aronofsky, Aronofsky's the last name, is a, is a loud mouth, vociferous atheist in the Hollywood community. So I was already initially suspect of him taking on the project. Um, it, it tanked largely, which is good, but that hasn't stopped a more famous director, Ridley Scott, from taking. I don't know if you've seen, there's going to be a, a Moses epic coming out with uh, Christian Bale. So, uh, in fact, they're billing it as better than Noah. So, yeah, anyway, uh, well, we, we can only hope, right? But there's all sorts of, in the, in the Noah tale, it was almost a complete trashing of the, the traditional Noah narrative uh, from top to bottom. Uh, so uh, very, very, uh, very interesting. But I want you to think for a little, what, how would you respond personally with somebody assuming with a straight face that the Gospels in particular and the Bible in general is mythography? Um, I want you to think in your head how, would you, how you'd respond to this sort of thing. Um, some run towards the fact that it looks more historical and the archaeology behind the Bible. That's not a bad place to go. But is there more to be said there? What, what's the scholarly consensus? And what's frustrating I've found in my doctoral studies is that there's, not, there's been a lot of new data unearthed, a lot of uh, stellas with inscriptions on them, lots of, uh, of ancient uh, documentation that's been unearthed in the last 50, 60, 70 years. But there's, there's nothing that would move the Bible into the category of mythography, unless you just assume anything that has any supernatural element in it must be mythography automatically. If that's the case, you shouldn't pay attention to almost any ancient literature. We can just kiss goodbye ancient, ancient history classes all the way across the board. But the idea is what, what, what's precipitated this change? Sometimes the culture goes well ahead of the scholarship in a number of areas, but this is something that's starting to become increasingly disconcertingly uh, 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 ubiquitous, where everybody's just saying, hey, you know, this is mythology. It's mythology. So is there more to be said about this sort of thing? These two books address this, the Walton book and the Oswald book, directly and say, well, look, here's what scholars used to say. This new situation hasn't changed, but somehow it's, things have been flipped. Uh, even as far back as 60 years ago, you had uh, Harvard professors like uh, uh, Professor Wright of Ancient Near Eastern, Near Eastern Studies and a William Albright, who's a professor of archaeology, saying the Bible just doesn't, the God of Israel has no mythology. This is not mythological. You can't, the, the categories are far too dissimilar. Even C.S. Lewis said linguistically it's dissimilar. It just doesn't have, what does that mean linguistically? It doesn't have the genre hallmarks of a mythography, especially when you start getting to the New Testament. Old Testament, same way. So um, I wanted to give you, as we, we start off, the, the, some people will just say, look, the Bible itself says it's not mythography. Now, in an age of deconstruction, that's enough for some people. So you look at things like 2 Peter 1.16, right? 1 Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 4. These are places where Paul or Peter respectively, and Paul respectively both say, these aren't myths. So you already see that even in the oral, before it's, it's written down, in the oral community, the oral transmission, which was the common way of transmitting data in the ancient world, you see this sort of, they're already dealing with this apologetic, that what we're telling you is not mythology. It's, it's not. The church fathers would also have to deal with this sort of thing. So um, you could go with those scriptural references. Those aren't bad. That's not a bad place to start. But I wanted to give you a little more, put a little more meat on the bones uh, for this sort of thing today and look at the differences. If you laid massive number of myth uh, alongside the Bible, Old and New Testament, what stark differences would emerge? And this isn't new study. These are something people have been aware of for 100 years, but somehow the, the scholarly tide has changed a bit. Um, as a matter of fact, Oswald says that the, one of the reasons is because of relativism today, the massive push towards relativism, which he says, at the end of the day, philosophically, relativism is just breaking down barriers between things, right? So you break down distinctions between things. Well, aren't we really talking about the same thing? Um, I had a, a, a gentleman at my, at my academy that we hired inadvertently that um, was, was committed to the idea of the Bible being mythology, but he said, well, look, there's truth in myth, right, when we, when we watch Lord of the Rings, there are existential truths that leap out of that fictional narrative. And I'm like, well, now you're kind of softening the word myth. But this guy couldn't see distinctions between anything. Uh, he'd make comments like, um, uh, we were talking about uh, a terrorist one day. And he said, well, I am, I'm a Tory. My, my family has a Tory background in England. And I said, well, what? he's like, well, George Washington was a terrorist. And you're like, well, 
Well, before we, you know, before we take George Washington off the dollar bill and he didn't, you know, he didn't kill innocents and target them, you know, this sort of thing. There's a number of distinctions that would take Washington, though a revolutionary, out of the category of, say, a bin Laden. But he couldn't see those. He couldn't see that, you know, he, he just kind of blurred distinctions between things all the time. And that's one of the things Walton says is the reason why the mythography thing is becoming more prominent with the Bible is because we're increasingly getting to an age where you don't want to say something's true or false, right or wrong, moral or immoral. Uh, factual or non-factual, it's it's we're kind of getting to that blurring of the line scenario. You know, what's what does marriage mean? This sort of thing. The whole the whole uh, the whole shooting match. So let's go ahead and start. And I want to give you one of the biggest. If you only get one thing, that's the biggest. If you had to lay all these, and I found this to be exceedingly true in my last three years of research for my PhD. What's the biggest distinction between the Hebrew Bible and uh, if you had a number of major pagan epic myths? Beside, laid them alongside each other, it would be this difference. And it's a little bit of an abstract, two abstract concepts, so I'll try to make them as concrete as possible. There's a difference between continuity and transcendence. Continuity and transcendence. In the ancient world, the supernatural and natural were seen to be continuous, nearly one entity. So things that happened in the natural could affect the supernatural, and things that happened in the supernatural could affect the natural. So you had this sort of, this massive continuity. In the, the Hebrews were distinct in the fact they said God is transcendent, he is other. In fact, the word holiness in Hebrew is hesed, holiness, loving kindness, this sort of separation. One of the most interesting parts when Jesus is asked, how should we pray? He says, holy father, holy father, transcendent, but an intimate relationship as well. So you have both of these coming together. But the continuity aspect is really, really big, and it'll help inform all the other differences we'll talk about. For example, why didn't Hebrews ever have cult prostitution in their temples? Well, they didn't believe, A, that God was sexed, or that sex with a prostitute would affect the supernatural realm. They didn't have that continuity idea. Why did they not have an idol that you get your hands on manipulate? Because manipulating an idol didn't affect the transcendent God. Transcendence, difference, versus continuity, everything the same, is one of the biggest differences. And it's one of the major distinctions the Hebrew people are sui generis, very unique, and known, and known for in the ancient world, and even today. So... The continuity versus transcendence idea will actually inform all the other ones. And you see this sort of thing. Why in myths is bestiality spoken of sometimes positively? Well, because the animal world and the human world are they're continuous, right? Uh, why is incest sometimes spoken positively of? Well, child, parent, no big deal. Why is prostitution acceptable, right? Well, because marriage, non-marriage, no distinctions blurred, continuity. Uh, this is what we're, we're going to be talking about in here, and this is easily, both of these guys, both uh, Oswald and Walton say, look, this is the key. You get this interpretive key, you're going to see a major difference between the two. Now, can you explain that to a lay person? You could just say, look, when you lay these things aside, scholars see a big difference between the Hebrew saying God is other, though can be made intimate, and everything's the same, and everything's continuous and affects one another in a very intimate and strongly connected way. The second uh, difference that uh, should be quite obvious to you is polytheism versus monotheism. In nearly every ancient tradition, whether ancient Near Eastern, uh, uh, Greco or Greco-Roman, uh, the Hellenized tradition, that you have polytheism as the operative assumption amongst the ancient people groups. Again, Hebrews very, very unique in their monotheistic Strain. There is one. I mean, if there's anything that marks you separating yourself or literally leaving the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's the idea of many gods versus one God. Look in the Bible. There are more affirmations of God having no rivals, being alone, no no petty jealousies going on. There's no separation of powers. So why why is polytheism so common in every other culture, and not the biblical model? Well, again, it's continuity versus transcendence, right? If we look around our world and we see a multiplicity of different factors and forces and different emanations or uh, results of nature. Well, then, right, it's going to be a number of deities, right? It's, there's going to be a continuity in number of forces as well. So you have different deities that affect different things. So you have Poseidon, the god of the sea, right? You have um, uh, Hermes, the, the god of speed. You know, you have these different, you have Zeus, the head god, but the god, you know, that kind of controls the storms, thunderbolts, this sort of thing. So you have, you have this multiplicity of forces that are represented, are represented in the polytheistic pantheon. So you have this sort of thing uh, going on, and the Bible is, <laughs> is arrestingly clear about God having no rivals. I mean, any, anybody that reads, even if you just read Isaiah 40 through 47, those seven chapters in Isaiah, you'd see probably the strongest Old Testament affirmations 
of God's individual power and his, supremity, uh, his supreme nature uh, that you'll find any, anywhere else in the Bible, at least in a, in a corpus. Um, let's go to the next one, Steve, if you don't mind. Obviously, if you're polytheistic, you're going to have idol worship. Again, the Jews did not, uh, did not worship idols. In fact, God expressly forbids graven images. Uh, this is not at all uh, common in the ancient world. Um, so what's interesting is 60, 70 years ago, you had scholars saying, well, look, the big thing about the, the difference between, let's say, Israelites and the Babylonians is, yeah, they both had temples, and they both had inner courts and outer courts, but the big difference is one has a giant idol that they manipulate in the middle of it, and the Hebrews have no idol there. Well, now they'd flip that on its head and say, well, they have an inner court and an outer court. Oh, the, the non-essentials, the fact there's no idol or an idol. When that used to be assumed, the essential, they've kind of flipped it. What used to be the essential differences are now non-essential differences, and the minor amount of similarities are now seen to be the essentials. But idol worship is expressly forbidden. In fact, even a graven image. And I'll tell you, in my life, I don't want to sound legalistic, but in my life, I've... It's sometimes difficult when you read some of these injunctions against making an image uh, of God. And you see these, these statues. I love beautiful works of art that have God represented. And uh, even though I know he's not a bemuscled Italian geriatric, uh, it, it's, it's kind of nice to see those sort of things. And, you know, I like the, the images some of Jesus, the statues of Jesus. I don't know why. I always remember the uh, a kid sent me, a, one of my students sent me a, a, a picture and a, and a blurb from, a, a you know, in, in the Midwest they have these, butter competitions, right, where they carve butter. I don't know if you knew this. There was a butter Jesus that was carved that won the award one year, and it tastes and see that I am. Anyways, but it's, uh, it was really, I was like, oh, okay. But, you know, I, I have struggled with the idea of graven image and how far that goes. Now, I do know that if you look in the ancient world, the whole point was don't make an image, don't, don't even go down the road of a physical, manipulatable idol that's supposed to affect what, you, what, what happens between you and I. That's not the Bible. The Bible is, look, here's a long history of people that have either obeyed or disobeyed, and the results. Follow them in the obedience, reject the disobedience, and learn. It is a historical documentation of ethical decisions that are made either in favor of covenant or against covenant. That's not, uh, here's how the idol should be constructed. Next category, Steve, please. Big, big difference in almost every, especially ancient Near Eastern uh, myth, that means prior to the Greco-Roman era, you, you know, Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Persians. You have this idea that matter was always eternal. This is going to be especially prominent for you guys in Dr. Craig's class, who's made a living on the Kalam cosmological argument. The eternity of not just any matter, but chaotic matter that has no form and has no shape is something that is such a common motif in the, in the ancient Near Eastern mythical uh, dramatic mythical creation stories that it's, it's a stark contrast. You don't have matter being eternal in the Bible. It's created ex nihilo out of nothing by God the Father. In fact, you have sometimes a female personification of matter, and it's always chaotic, and then the matter produces the gods first, and the planets, and the universe, all the, these sort of things, the supernatural realm, the gods, and then they real, the, the eternal matter somehow becomes personalized and says, oh gosh, my creations are going to try to manipulate me so they, there's a battle, right? And the matter, the, matter, the eternal matter tries to kill the emanations that it's created because it's going to manipulate matter. We don't have anything like that. In fact, it is a stark contrast in our creation narratives. Extraordinarily different. We do not have an eternity of matter that's fighting against the creations. Uh, we have, uh, instead, we have matter created and manipulated in some way by God. <clears throat> Next category, please. Um, Again, this is just, uh, I think, a, a second sort of uh, supplement to what we just talked about, the creation process, organization of pre-existing matter and energy. The creation process is uh, creation of matter and energy. We just said that. All right, this is some place where I think most of you would go when I first asked you the rhetorical question at the beginning of this, of, of this uh, teaching, which is, what would you say to somebody if they said the Bible is really mythog it's mythography? It's a myth. I think a lot of us tend to jump to the historical, and this isn't a bad point, uh, Oswald and Walton uh, make, both make this point that, look, you have a general disdain for authentic history in myth. There's no question about it. Here's why. Supernatural beings don't care about human beings. They don't care what all goes on down here. If, if best case scenario were faded, worst case scenario were non-relevant non and non-important. Nothing's meaningful. So there's no connection. It's not like, you know, some mythographer sits down and goes, now, am I being right about now, what was going on I, I, in northern Egypt at the time? They don't do that sort of thing. There's absolutely zero correspondence, generally, 
with, with, with history. And let me show you some of this. This is kind of getting at what C.S. Lewis talked about when he said, okay, what's the difference here between, I mean, there's a major difference between when you look at mythography and you look at uh, uh, the Bible. And I'm not saying it's a pure, straight out historical documentation, but it does look far more like that linguistically and structurally than mythography. Let me give you some examples. If you look at Mark 10, Mark 10, we have an example in the Gospels of Jesus healing blind Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, and it's told where he is. So if you read this account in the ancient world, you can go to Jericho and try to find Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. You don't have that kind of detail and fact-checking possibility going on in myth at all, at all. I mean, we're not even sure there's ever a person named Achilles, but... He did some pretty cool things, and maybe the only example of a historicalized fiction genre in the ancient world. That, it's common today to have a mythical story or a fiction story in, encased in a, uh, in a historical genre that's, that's surrounded by authentic facts. Take, like, the movie The Patriot, right? I mean, there was a revolutionary war, but, you know, the, the story of the, the dad and his son in the middle of that wasn't, wasn't an authentic one, at least uh, not by, no one was claiming that. So... Uh, the only example you have of historicalized fiction in the ancient world really is the Iliad and the Odyssey. Really, that's about it, because we do know there was a Troy, we do know there was a battle. Probably wasn't an Achilles, a number of gods, this sort of thing. Probably wasn't an Ajax, this sort of thing. But outside of that, you don't have them mixing these genres very much. You don't have this sort of mix and match going on, or at least not, like, not commonly like we see it today. Um, give you another example. If you look at Luke 1, what does Luke say at the beginning, his prologue, right, to, to his gospel? He says, I'm, I'm writing up an orderly account based on research for you, O oh, excellent Theophilus. I want you to be aware of what the Romans are saying about these Christians and what actually happened with Jesus. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about this. Luke Acts is considered to be one of the most historically accurate and concrete gospels, tandem books in the New Testament. Um, if you wanted to put this gentleman's name down, Colin Hamer, Colin Hamer. Colin Hamer went through the last 16 uh, chapters of Acts and found 86 points of archaeological corroboration in Acts alone. It is a gem of historical reliability in the ancient world. But let's talk about that prologue first. First, you notice that Luke is going to give you an inspired account through research. Have you ever thought about that? The Holy Spirit's going to inspire what he does through interviewing people, traveling to Paul, and gathering research from sources. That's interesting. You're going to get an inspired document on the back end of research rather than just, you know, I hope you don't have the Muslim view, their eyes rolled back, and they just kind of, you know, someone took control of their hands. So, uh, and that's, that's not a caricature. That's really, he would wrap himself up, Muhammad, and roll back and forth and hear gonging in his ears when he gave everything after the first revelation, and then, you know, kind of give it, and scribes would write it down. Colin Hamer, um, the, the name of the book, if you want to look at it, if you want to go for it, it's called The Book of Acts, and it's setting in Hellenistic history. <laughs> Again, a very bare-bones basic title, not very creative. But what you see in the prologue is a form that is just like the ancient historians use. The ancient hist historians like Lucian, Thucydides, Polybius, Herodotus, they use that same, I'm writing up an account so that you'll know. And I'm going to give you as best I can based on the best research I can. This is a prologue that matches hardcore historical narrative or historical documentation in the ancient world. As a matter of fact, Craig Blomberg, who's a, uh, a New Testament scholar, an astounding New Testament scholar at Denver Seminary, I believe, says that you, could even, you even see connections between scientific, not that it's a scientific treatise, scientific and medical treatises in the ancient world that were treated very, very seriously and scrutinized heavily for their accuracy in this first chapter of Luke. So again, you have a really, really strong connection to history going on here. And... Um, Last one, I'll give you Acts 2.22. Acts 2.22. You have something going on that F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, the, uh, the great New Testament scholar from Manchester, said one of the things you see that's, again, common to ancient history rather than, or ancient biograph biographical history rather than mythography, is this comment that you find in two comments in one verse in Acts 2.22, and it's this. We are witnesses to these things, and as you yourselves know, you don't see that occurring anywhere except for people that are trying to give history saying look check it out we're witnesses talk to us and if you don't believe us you know this you you can talk to other people about this this is not a phrase found in mythography at all these are phrases that are extreme so this is what when somebody just says qed kind of well it's not it doesn't have the linguistic qualities of mythography you can kind of get a handle of what they're talking about intro to luke the the book of acts 
the idea in, in uh, Acts 2.22 or any of these, or like the Mark 10 passage, right, where you can go and I encourage you to go check it out. You don't see Homer saying, hey, go find Achilles and interview him. You don't, you don't have that. Give it a shot, right? Ajax is a little mean, but he might give you a good interview. You don't have this sort of thing, but you have this encouragement. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15, right? The great Pauline creedal declaration that he had received from someone. You have that received and delivered going on right there that says, look, I'm getting something that's much older than, than even this book, which is supposed to be written in the early 50s. And it's, it's all the, the, the necessary components of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, or at least the, the bare bones creedal affirmation. And then he says, go, ask witnesses. Go do this. This isn't mythography. So, uh, yeah, let's move on from there. Go to the next one. Uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but nearly every myth, whether you go Babylonian, Persian, uh, Grecian, or Roman, has a cyclical view of history, right? We, when we see this sort of thing, right, we have a cyclical sort of idea going, or not idea, but in our, our existence. We non-existence, then we become existent. We're dependent on our parents, then we become independent. Then we become dependent again when we're old. And then we go into non-existence again. So you see this cyclical view. Well, then the ancients said, well, if that's the way human life goes, then everything's a circle, right? God would say there are things that repeat. There's nothing new under the sun, right, in Ecclesiastes. But it's a linear view. We're heading somewhere. History's heading somewhere. It's not truly cyclical. It has cyclical elements, but it's heading somewhere in a linear fashion. There's a past, a present, and a future. We're not getting into A and B theories of time. Don't even go there. But, uh, but yeah, I wanted to go at least give you that. That's another staunch, staunch difference between the two genres when you look across, the, across uh, all, all of the ancient uh, communities that produce these works. Next one, Steve, please. Now, we kind of hit on this with idols and why idols, again, there's that continuity idea and the manipulation idea that whatever's manipulated in the idol will have an effect in the supernatural realm, which will reverberate in the, con in the continuous and then come back to the human. Sacrifice and magic to manipulate the gods is not something, if you think that's what Hebrew sacrifice is, you're not getting this correct. The sacrifice was a reminder that the covenant was broken and a hope in the future of, a, of an amelioration or a, a covenant coming back together again. So again... If you look at the Hebrew uh, sacrificial system as magic to manipulate God into doing good things for you, that's not what was, what was going on there. You didn't have certain incantations. You didn't have certain uh, uh, long, lengthy uh, sort of prayers that magically got God to do things. You certainly didn't have a manipulation of a graven image that would get God to do something in the supernatural realm, which would affect the human world. So again, um, sacrifice and magic in order to manipulate, not a reminder of a covenant, not a reminder of a covenant, and an encouragement in the future, rather manipulation to get the gods to do what you want. This is one of the things you see in even uh, infants, right, when they would sacrifice their firstborn in the ancient Near Eastern cultures, right, put them on Moloch's hands, the statue of Moloch's hands, and put the infant on there and burn them. They, they thought the particular painful death would be uh, important in the firstborn, which is what, the most prized possession in an ancient agrarian culture was your firstborn. So if you give the God your prized possession and kill it in a very painful way, that God would have to repay you in some way. So you have this, you don't have it, you have God disdaining that, saying that's, that's, not, that's not at all what I'm requiring. As a matter of fact, it makes a little more sense of the, uh, the Abraham and Isaac scenario too, that there was, a, there was this sort of, okay, go do this, but don't do it. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. All right, next, next slide, please. Um, the gods are viewed as not very <laughs> well behaved. They're given props for their power in these ancient cultures, but they're not, they always are misbehaving. They're always petty. They're always squabbling and fighting. Zeus can't keep control of his wives or his children. Uh, they're always vying for power and worried about what, what, what each other are doing. You don't really have that. The moral character of God is unmatched. That's, again, a very, very specific Hebrew quality. The moral character of God is unmatched. Even Zeus is up to no good, the, the father of all the gods in the Greek pantheon. You have Zeus doing all sorts of immoral things, raping people, taking the form of animals, deceiving people. You don't, and you have all of his progeny and his, the gods that are your brothers and sisters and things like this are always vying with one another and seen, quite frankly, as lowbrow, but not very moral beings at all petty, squabbling, and immoral. In fact, this is one of the, uh, the arguments lodged by Socrates, according to you know, his disciple Plato, against the idea of, go of what's going on in the Greek pantheon. All right, let's go to the next one, please. Uh, this is, again, common with this sort of thing, but you don't really have a fixed standard of morality. 
Why? Because, right, there's, your community may have certain gods they prize that have certain moral qualities. Another community may have gods they prize that have immoral qualities, maybe, that your community would never deal with. And that's okay because there's multiple gods and multiplicity of things going on. There's not one god who's the fixed moral point of reference. That's, again, a very unique thing to the Hebrew Bible that's not common in, uh, in mythography. I'm going to try to rush through these guys so you can get, we can get a little time for questions at the end. All right, next up. Deities limited knowledge and in power. Now, again, if you're going to separate all the powers because we see a multiplicity of powers in the earth and there's a continuity between what happens on earth and what happens in the supernatural, well, then, obviously, the power is going to be split up. Even Zeus uh, has, uh, even though we, they're immortal, they become immortal, they, uh, they are they can pass out of existence, but not truly out of existence in the Babylonian and the Sumerian and in the uh, uh, Assyrian and even some of the Persian narratives, mythological narratives. But when you get to, the, to Greece and Rome, they start to become immortal, where they, but they can still suffer. They just can't die completely. But again, deities are limited in knowledge and limited in power because you're splitting the power and the knowledge amongst a number of deities, right, that reflect that continuity. They, they act just like really powerful humans right? uh, and have all the same sort of foibles. Next category, please. Humans, I've mentioned this before, humans are devalued in the mythical corpus. Why? Two reasons, right? One, you're either completely faded. So what, what does it matter? Nothing you do really matters. You can think of the, the old Sisyphus tale where Sisyphus is judged and said, all right, you're going to move this rock up this hill and it's going to roll back down and you're going to do this for all eternity. It doesn't matter. Your fate is set. Or, you know what? Humans are so, they lack so much power. Who cares? What's really important what the gods are doing and maybe how we can get some of that power manipulated. Perhaps one of the reasons Jesus wept, which is another very unique feature of a, of a, of a, a center of a world religious movement. Why did Jesus go off and cry? He wasn't given to crying all the time. He's kind of a, oh, you know, I know we've feminized Jesus a lot in that, in that sense, but he's, he went off and cried because right when, when he did the, the loaves and the fishes, I believe in the, first, in the first event of those two events, they said, we want to make you king. Now, normally you go, that's right, I am king, right? Raise your fist. Jesus went off and seemed to realize that they just wanted him to destroy Rome with that power. I mean, you can understand the desire to get the, get the shackles of Rome off him and not be enslaved after you know, thousands of years, this sort of thing. But it, that wasn't why Jesus came. And he thought, gosh, they just want this power for themselves. So it's, one, it's kind of odd to have somebody you know, rightly proclaim him, right, king, but obviously they did it in the wrong, in the wrong spirit or else he wouldn't have gotten upset about it. Next category, please. We, are, we just talked about this. Humans are faded. In the Bible, look, the Bible doesn't work. Oh, I'm going to tick off the calendar. The Bible doesn't seem to work if humans are faded in a direction where they can do nothing to affect any, even the minute aspects of their life. Why? Because the Bible is a chronicle of how people use their free will either for covenant with God or against covenant and the results. It's supposed to encourage you to follow these, these precepts and do them yourself. If you're faded, it doesn't really matter. Do them, don't do them. You're either going to heaven or hell. And this is, this is the problem when, you know, Augustine stopped, taught on a hardline predestinarian uh, scenario. He had a number of people in his, uh, in his area, in North Africa and Carthage, start living like, literally like hell, like partying like crazy. What's the point? Whether I party or not, I'm fated to go to heaven or hell. It doesn't matter. I can't change it one way or the other. So... There's no point. Well, what's the point in living holy? Um, matter is eternal. We already talked about that. Uh, I don't know why I put that up. But just to let you know, one of the distinctions is spirit's eternal. Spirit's the eternal thing, and spirit's the beginning of everything, not matter being the beginning and the eternal thing and everything, uh, uh, or energy in the, uh, in, the Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew approach to origins. Okay, last slide, Steve, if you don't mind. These I'm just going to go through. You can write down which ones you want. <laughs> Sorry, they're not. I didn't have the animations ready, but... Um, God's higher powers, uh, God, God's or the higher powers are sexed, sexed. They have males and females, right? Sometimes both, not many times, but sometimes they, they're androgynous. But you don't have that. God's not only sex, not sexed, but he doesn't engage in sexual activity. Okay, so you have a very, very different view. Because we don't have this continuity, God is not sexed like we are i mean the, there's a number of reasons why the male pronouns are used of god and the male sort of titles are used of god father warrior husband this sort of thing but i i, I don't think that means that god is genitalia i mean I, I, theologically i don't think and it certainly doesn't follow that he's having sex in some realm like the, some of the mormons believe or 
I guess used to believe they're going through a lot of a lot of shakeup in that in that community. But uh, but he's not only is he not sexed, but we don't have a him having sex. Consequently, that's why you don't have sexual activity going on in the temple scenarios. And in fact, God disdains that sort of thing. Marriage is sacred. Prostitution's bad. I mean, if you look in the Proverbs, you see prostitution being a really, really negative sort of thing, spoken negatively. In fact, though God allows multiple wives in polygamy, notice in the Bible it's always spoken of negatively. Always. It's always in a negative scenario. And we see this, right, from the creation account. God made it Adam and Eve, not Adam, Eve, Ava, and Elaine. Right? And then we also see this in, in, the, in, the, in the scenarios where he's warning Israel. Don't you know, one of the warnings, if you want a king like your pagan neighbors, it's going to take your daughters, a lot of them, and have harems. You're not going to want that. It's not going to be good for him or you guys. We want it anyway. So you see God, again, sort of like divorce, allowing for it but not endorsing it. Okay, the difference between a descriptive event in the Bible and a prescriptive event, something God wants and tells us to do. Um, uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit before. Um, we're related to the gods primarily with magic formulas. One of the reasons I, I, I doubled this up here is because Many, many scholars, even skeptical ones today, do not dispute that Jesus did some sort of supernatural works. I don't know if you knew this. Even the most liberal skeptical scholars won't dispute that he did some special works that garnered him a following. It wasn't just his pithy sayings that garnered him a following. It was the fact that he did things that were unexplainable. Why? Primarily because we have enemy attestation of this sort of thing. You have a brilliant skeptic of Christianity in the uh, uh, mid-3rd century or late, first, uh, late 2nd century, early 3rd century named Celsus, who just said, well, Jesus must be a magician. His parent, I mean, he spent some time in Egypt, right? So the Egyptians are known for having magicians. He's just a magician. You have the uh, Jews uh, in, in, in some of their uh, extra-biblical works calling him a sorcerer or a wizard of some sort. So when you have enemies saying this sort of thing about you, then there has to be something special about what you were doing. So, um, again, notice, though, Jesus doesn't use magical formulas. He doesn't use magical incantations to manipulate God. He doesn't even call on the name of God a lot of times, like some other Jewish holy men did, to get a miracle to occur. He does it in his own authority, which is, again, very, very unique. Um, last one, history is largely unimportant to the religious traditions. Again, this is human history. History, uh, again, of history and disobedience, we've hit on this many, many times. And Oswald closes out his book in this way as well and says, look... The Bible isn't about manipulating God to do favors for you. It clearly isn't about that. In fact, it, just, it disdains that. And in that sense, it's radically, radically different. Um, if you wanted an example, just to move back to that first category of continuity and transcendence, I wanted you to put down, you can put under that category, Exodus 34, just as we wrap up here. Again, because that's the most important difference that informs all these other differences. If you look at Exodus 34, Moses is up on the mountain dealing with the invisible God that has no image. Right? And they've just had miracle after miracle after miracle. And they tell Aaron, make us a golden calf like the one in Egypt, because this is the God who brought us out of Egypt. Now, the reason Moses came down is he's like, well, if you haven't gotten anything else, this is not a continuity thing. God is different. He's, but why did they do that? Why a bull? Well, a bull's an animal. It's continuous with humans and the earth, and the supernatural is continuous with the natural. So... That God that brought us out was probably the same God the Egyptians worshipped, the same being that we've milked at times, <laughs> right? Would be, you wouldn't milk a calf, but you know what I mean. So the golden calf is made, and it's made out of what? A physical substance. So you see this thing going on, and God's saying, no, 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 no. I know that's how everybody else thinks, but we're thinking differently here. I'm not, I can't be put into any human, in, into any sort of human graven image that can be manipulated for your favor, Okay. With that, I think that's just about, I think that's at least the end of my presentation. Um, one last um, comment, though, if you wanted to follow up on this. We've got some really, really good resources in our evangelical tradition that you could, uh, one guy I wanted to mention was Kenneth Kitchen. Kenneth Kitchen, let me write his name down. Kenneth Kitchen is one of the most respected archaeologists slash, slash Egyptologist specialists in the ancient world. Kenneth Kitchen wrote a book called On the Reliability of the Old Testament. These aren't very creatively named, right? <laughs> All Bible and Myth, On the Reliability of the Old Testament, uh, Ancient Near Eastern, thank you, Ancient Near Eastern Thought in the Old Testament. So, uh, but Kitchen is another fantastically an, a erudite scholar, a very, very, uh, very reliable scholar that says, look, you just have A, a difference between the two, and look, there's a lot of history here that, again, is one of those separating categories between uh, myth and reality, okay?
with that, I'd like to ask if there's any questions at all. We've got about five minutes. Yes. I was just wondering, um, what are your little footnote marks, whatever? Uh, the foot, oh, the, the star there. Um, this is for me when I teach it at, a, at, at school, and I can, I can uh, comment further on that. Yes, it's not, you've told me not to do that in PowerPoint. This is why. No, uh, it, it's just a, an elaboration on that. So that would be, uh, there's a long commentary about cur uh, the, the Corinthian community where Paul tried to, uh, you've got to give him props for trying to build a church in Corinth, which, I mean, it's, uh, according to extra-biblical history, people would say, don't act like a Corinthian. I mean, that's how immoral Corinthians were in the ancient world. He wanted to plant a church right in the middle of that, what we call moral cesspool. And so I wanted to comment about how that's there, that one of the one of the heavy aspects was temple prostitution in Corinth. And that's a holdover all the way back. You had temple prostitution going on, even homosexual temple prostitution, all the way back uh, in, into, uh, gosh, 1200, 1400 B.C. So it's, this is something that was radically different that the Christians and the Jews were proposing, but was going on. In quite a few ways, and this explains a lot of the, the language about females, about silence and hair covering, it makes a lot. It makes a lot of sense. And in case you're going, well, okay, are you saying that's contextual? You don't have to pay attention to it. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying sometimes you have a specific, and sometimes you have a general rule, right? And Paul's trying to deal with the specific. If a woman approaches a man in the Corinthian context and speaks to her at a church service, they're assuming they're going to sleep together and they're going to have a financial transaction, just like they did in the Temple of Artemis uh, in Corinth. So. You have this sort of thing going on. Well, what about long hair? Well, if your hair is uncovered, it's the same thing. They're assumed it's a temple prostitute. Somebody comes into the new Christian church. Sorry, I'm speaking so fast. But comes into the new Christian church in Corinth and like, all right, Christians got it going on. A lot of uncovered heads and speaking. Well, you know, you're kind of doing this. Sort of, so well, wait a second, Mulder Hill. If you're saying that, then does that mean we can ignore the whole Bible's written to other people in other contexts? So can we just ignore it? Well, no, that's a specific. The general rule is, right, don't mislead people, especially in a Christian context, right? If you're in a church setting, don't mislead people. Don't send them astray. But, I mean, obviously, I see a lot of uncovered heads. I don't think they're literally in a brothel. They're uh, head to the brothel, you know, after defender's class. So it is a different cultural context. So, look, the general rule holds. The specifics are what you need to make sense of. So, yeah. Uh, any, yes, go ahead. <laughs> you, Brad, go for it. Absolutely. There's also poetry Absolutely. and analogy. Absolutely. And sometimes we get drawn into taking the stuff that is, I think, written historically and turning it into analogy. And therefore, the idea of the creation yes, is yeah. a myth. Yes, the yes. idea of Adam and Eve are a myth. What yes. do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, very interesting thing. I... There's some scholars that sit in the middle ground there and say it's, it's, it's more of an epic, so it has truthful historical aspects, but some of maybe the specifics are a little uh, uh, with the creation account. What I will tell you is this. All the overblown claims of the Gilgamesh epic looks just like the creation and the, and the deluge, other the heavily represented great flood. They're more dissimilar than similar. When you actually sit down and look at these things, it's like the time where you think, well, Nostradamus predicted until I read Nostradamus' predictions. It's like, this has been overplayed. So, uh, so yeah, and thanks for offering the qualifier, Brad, because there are certainly different genres. Um, I don't tend to think that, I mean, I'm, I'm not alone here, but maybe you disagree that I don't think the parables were authentic or actual. So if Jesus tended to use stories that may not have had a historical component, there may not have been a guy, a vineyard owner that got killed, you know, then... Uh, then certainly we got to recognize those those elements. But as far as the Old Testament thing where there's connections, you have to always say, look, what's the, the differences make a difference. That's the thing, and that's exactly what's kind of flipped. That's the, what I've talked about, the, frustra the frustrating part of this whole process has been there's not like new data's come out. And oh, the Bible's clearly a myth. It's what's happened is they've taken this, the, the vague, less numerous similarities and acted like they're essentials now. When when. Just years ago, even liberals were like, it's just not mythography. It's something else. It's just not that. But even in the Old Testament accounts, you don't have, like I said, you have temple structure that's now central rather than the fact that there's no graven image and it's not a transaction and they're not having temple sex in there. That's, that used to be okay. You can't say they're the same. Now it's, well, those are sort of sidebar. The real thing is they both had a similar temple. They both worshiped in a temple. And like, so that, that's one of the things I'm trying to ferret out with my doctoral dissertation is differences make a difference. It's like that in any area of life. How you manage your differences are going to, equate to whether you're successful or non-successful in life. So, I mean, you know, it's a fancy logical fallacy called the fallacy of the undistributed middle, and it basically means not distributing all the things that are different, you know, in a similarity. I've got ears, an elephant's got ears, I'm not an elephant. 
So, I mean, I, you know, you can say, well, there's, hey, there's similarities, but that's blurring of those distinctions is what really gets us into trouble, right? Um, and you can see that across the board. If I blur the distinction between parent and child, well, incest is okay. Well, there you go. If I blur the distinction between, you know, marriage and prostitution, well, what the, they're all the same. So you kind of blur these distinctions, and then, and then all of a sudden you can't really make the hallmark of logical thinking, clear logical thinking is the ability to make significant distinctions and even connect stuff that may, may not be there, too. So, yeah, uh, anybody, uh, anybody else? Yes. Yes. Very interesting, too, because Job isn't supposed to be a Hebrew, and somehow God's showing his favor on him, so you have this sort of general revelation scenario going on. There is a prologue of Job where there's a supernatural discussion going on between Satan and God and this sort of thing, and then there is a very, then all of a sudden it shifts to this very, very rather bland historical, they're supernatural, but a bland historical account where I've always had trouble reading it because his three friends... Uh, which aren't going to be featured in baby books anytime soon. You know, Bill, Dad, Zophar. But, but they're, they're all telling him the wrong thing. And we're supposed to read this. But again, you're supposed to see, okay, don't jump to conclusions about these sort of things. So I, I would say, you know, Job is an interesting book. It's supposed to be one of the earliest Old Testament books. But you do still have an overwhelming sort of bland historical. But you see the same shift after you get past Genesis 5. And this sort of going, and when you move towards Abraham and the Chaldeans, it kind of, it the, the, the the language shifts a bit. There's not as much discussion of God and human interaction uh, as far as direct walking in the garden, this sort of thing, and, and, uh, and God's activity prior to humans being created. So I, I would say we do have features, something like that, in other parts of the Bible, but it still is overwhelming. It has an overwhelming sort of historic approach. I actually do think there was a Job. There was an actual Job, um, and I do think it, at the end of the day, the, the, the story of Job is supposed to teach us that it's, look, trust me. Why does God hit him with 64 questions back to back? Boom, 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 boom. Now, I've, I've heard pray, preachers go, he's talking trash, Job. You have no... I don't, think that's, I don't think God's chest bumping. But I think it's saying, look, you trust me with all these things you don't understand when they bless you, don't you? All the time. You, you have massive agricultural gain. You have, ma you have children. You have riches. You have blessings. And you don't even get how these things work. But you trust me. Now, bad things are happening that you don't understand and you won't. So... The real message seems to be, look, if you're going to trust me in, in the blessings with the unknown, trust me with the, with the negative stuff in the unknown. And, and he's basically saying, well, what makes you think you'd get it? Even if, I, even if I told you, do you think if I laid the whole thing out, would you, could you even get, you know, comprehended? Um, I, so I, I, you know, I'm not disappointed with the end of Job, but as far as the context of it being uh, mythography, it is an interesting book in the fact that you have, a, you have a precursor telling you what's going to go on that's supposed to interpret the rest of the book. Same thing goes on in Genesis, but you do have an overwhelming amount of very rather bland, historicalized type language in the discussion context from there on out. And even at the end, um, one more thing. When you get a miracle in the New Testament or in the Old Testament, it's usually rather bland. When you look at mythography, there's a long explanation of the miracle. But these grandiose themes that are brought in, and you get this full on, and I mean, it's, it's rather elaborate. You have a real restrained view, even of the Job miracles, the negative ones, and then the ones at the end where you get some experience of God. Same thing in the Gospels. You have a real restrained sort of matter. Well, he got healed. Ah, the storm calmed. It's, it's not a, there's not this long explanation of continuity or anything like that. So you have that sort of thing going on as well, that even, even in the supernatural events contained in Job, or even in the Jonah account, you have this real restrained narrative going on, uh, even though there's this mass, you know, a, a clear supernatural intervention. All right, guys, that's, we ought to cut it off. I hope you have a great week. Uh, if you have any questions, email Marion, and yeah, and I'll, I'll get you, get back to you, okay? All right.